This video is sponsored by Brilliant. So by now, you've probably heard these two facts. One, the planet is warming up. Two, the warming is caused by a huge amount of extra CO2 that has been added to the atmosphere. But a very reasonable question to ask, and it has come up in my comments a lot, is how do we know that we humans are responsible for that extra carbon, and so that warming? Well, let me present to you three reasons. Old Town, New Town, and Flavor Town. Old Town. Using pencil and paper, we can estimate how much carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere by first estimating how much fuel, meaning coal, oil and gas, we burn every year, and then multiplying that number by the amount of CO2 burning a tonne of each one of those types of fuels produces. This is an old calculation, first performed over a century ago by Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius. Check out my video on the history of global warming for more about that. This method isn't very accurate, as it doesn't account for other sources of emissions, like industry and farming, but it does give us a first estimate that we are putting tens of billions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. However, tens of billions of tons is nothing compared to the approximately 750 billion tons of CO2 added to the atmosphere from now natural sources every year. Those 750 billion tonnes of carbon added to the atmosphere every year are, however, almost exactly balanced by the amount of carbon that is sucked out of the atmosphere by the land and by oceans. Something we know because the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has barely changed over the past several thousand years, up until the last couple of centuries. So the tens of billions of tonnes we estimate we're adding to the atmosphere tip the balance of the natural carbon cycle. The buildup of extra carbon is due to us. But we can do better than this. Newtown. As you may also know, carbon dioxide affects the climate because it absorbs long wavelengths of radiation, meaning that the more of it there is in the atmosphere, the less long wavelength radiation emitted by the Earth, thermal radiation, reaches space. With technology Svante Arrhenius could only have dreamed of, a satellite can therefore look down on Earth, looking at specific wavelengths, and see dimming, and calculate how much CO2 there is in the section of atmosphere between it and the surface. If that dimming increases, then the amount of CO2 in that section of atmosphere must also have increased. We can work out how much by how much dimming we observe. And that is exactly what satellites like the Greenhouse Gases Observing Satellite and Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 do to produce near real-time datasets of how carbon dioxide levels change across the globe with high resolution. But we can go one better and put the observations into a weather prediction model. But instead of running it forwards in time to produce a forecast, we can run the model backwards in time to produce a hindcast, which can show us where the extra CO2 originally came from. Combine that with emissions reporting from countries and ground measurements, and you can create a dataset of where changes in atmospheric CO2 came from. Humans, land ecosystems, ocean ecosystems, or wildfires. In this visualization from NASA of cumulative changes in atmospheric carbon over a year, they are color-coded. The conclusion? The extra CO2 added to the atmosphere is overwhelmingly coming from where humans are burning fossil fuels, not from volcanoes, which would show up clear as day in these datasets as point sources, and we simply don't see. But this is basically just an updated, technologically advanced version of the calculation in Old Town. The really cool proof of our influence on the climate is in Flavor Town. You may remember that an element is defined by the number of protons in its nucleus. Carbon, for example, has six protons in its nucleus, and most of the time it has six neutrons in its nucleus as well. But sometimes it can have seven neutrons or even eight neutrons in its nucleus. We call these different forms of carbon its isotopes. Carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, named after the number of things in their nuclei. We can think of them as being like flavours of carbon. In nature, about 98.9% .9 of carbon is carbon-12, with about 1.1% being carbon-13. Less than a billionth of a percent of carbon atoms are carbon-14, a tiny fraction, but one we can definitely measure. If isotopes are like flavours, then an object made of carbon contains a flavour mix, almost entirely carbon-12, but with a dash of carbon-13 and just a tiny amount of carbon-14. However, that flavour mix, or the isotope percentages, will vary slightly depending on what object you're looking at. For example, plant matter has more carbon-12 in it, because its lighter isotope is more easily absorbed in photosynthesis. Plant matter's flavour mix is a bit less spicy. 
By contrast, carbon emissions from volcanoes contain more carbon-13, due to carbon-12 being more easily incorporated into crystal structures like rock below ground, leaving the carbon-13 in the gases that get ejected from volcanoes. The flavour mix is spicier than usual. Carbon-14 is the interesting one, though, because it's radioactive and so it decays into other elements over time. As such, the fraction of carbon-14 in an organic object decreases over time as the carbon-14 decays. We can use this fact to actually date organic objects, like, say, wooden artefacts, what we call radiocarbon dating. OK, so what's the atmosphere's flavour mix? Approximately 99% of the carbon in the atmosphere is carbon-12 and 1% carbon-13, with about a billionth of a percent carbon-14. But that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that the flavour mix is changing. It's getting less spicy. Firstly, the atomic tests of the mid-20th century caused a spike in radioactive carbon-14, which is still dying down. But secondly, since the Industrial Revolution, the fraction of carbon-13 in the atmosphere has decreased, as did the fraction of carbon-14 until we started detonating nukes. So what does that tell us? Well, in order to dilute the amount of carbon-13 and 14 in the atmosphere, the extra carbon that we know has been added must have a higher percentage of carbon-12 than normal, or equivalently, a lower than normal percentage of carbon-13 and 14. The lack of carbon-13 tells us that it can't be from volcanic sources, and the lack of carbon-14 tells us that it must be from an organic source that is very, very old. So old that its carbon-14 content has basically decayed to nothing. An organic source so old that it has fossilised. Like the coal and oil that we burn as fossil fuels. The remains of plant and animal life hundreds of millions of years ago, whose remains we have been burning and whose carbon we have been adding to the atmosphere in huge quantities since the Industrial Revolution, diluting the amount of carbon-13 and 14. The changing flavour mix, or more properly carbon isotope ratio, in the atmosphere is perhaps the strongest proof that we humans are responsible for the extra carbon that has been added to the atmosphere, and so the warming that we are experiencing. To use a word that the IPCC uses very rarely, the evidence is unequivocal, as is the fact that in order to stop the planet getting even hotter, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. It's not simple, but it's that simple. Did you know that in the next few years, solar will have more installed capacity to generate electricity than any other source, finally overtaking coal and capable of generating nearly a quarter of all our electricity? The 21st century is going to be powered by solar, and so an understanding of it is going to be essential. Fortunately, there is a free and easy way to do this. An interactive course on the fundamentals of solar systems is just one of the hundreds of courses available right now at Brilliant.org, who have kindly sponsored this video. Simply put, Brilliant is the best way to learn maths, science and computer science online. Their courses are built around interactivity, so introducing you to a new topic and then testing your understanding by getting you to immediately apply your knowledge in a fun way. In their course on solar power, for example, you are introduced to the concept of energy levels in atoms and then immediately tasked with applying that knowledge. And this is just one of thousands of lessons, with more added every month. Why not check out their course on predicting with probability or thinking in code, both essential skills in understanding climate science and projections of how our climate will change. As I've said in several previous videos, I wish that Brilliant had been around when I was at school. Having another resource that would supplement my learning in the classroom and give me opportunities to test my understanding in a different way would have been invaluable. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash simonclark, linked in the description. And the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, which would make an excellent present for a student in your life. That's brilliant.org slash simonclark, with thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for continuing to be, well, brilliant. Thank you for watching this video, which was an experiment. As you may have noticed, I've started doing vertical form content on YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels, and I've actually made two versions of this video. The one you've just watched, and a vertical one. 
I'm curious to see which one is going to reach more people and do more good. Follow me on socials, link down there in the description if you would like to see the results in coming weeks. Also in the description are the names of my lovely patrons who support me at patreon.com forward slash Simon Ox Fizz. On the screen right now are the names of my lovely executive producer patrons. If you would like to help me make more, bigger and better content and get access to exclusive behind the scenes vlogs and pick a video topic a month, then please do consider supporting me on Patreon. If you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like or better yet, give it a share in one of your group chats, maybe. If you'd like something to watch next, here are some of my previous videos. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.